So today we are going to be studying from the book of Romans. So if you brought your Bibles with you today, I encourage you to whip them out and open them up. If you have them on your phone, you could do so with the YouVersion app or go ahead and download the Journey Church app where you could follow along with the notes with us. For those of you who didn't, we will put them up there on the screens. And Romans is honestly one of the most terrifying and fulfilling books of the Bible for me. Lord willing, there's two books that I'd love to do in the next couple years ahead that I just want to do verse by verse, chapter by chapter, all the way through. Today, we're going to get a bit of the Cliff's Notes version of it, a one-day summary of Romans. Uh, But the uh, Exodus is one of those books I'm studying right now. I just love the book of Exodus and how the people are bound in slavery, and then God frees them so that they could freely worship him and spirit and in truth. And in many ways, Romans is the same way. There's this heart condition that we all have that separates us from God. And he tells us what the solution is, how we can truly become free in our spirits. So someday in the future, don't be surprised if we do a verse by verse series on Romans. The parallels between Roman society and ours are absolutely astounding. Much of the culture that we have here today comes from Roman culture. Their influence is found worldwide even today. When we were in Havana, Cuba, the architecture when we got off, the first thing that Mary Jo says is it feels like we're back in Rome. They've influenced almost everything. In fact, not so randomly, but I was listening to a podcast on the way in this morning, and he was talking about how the Romans actually stored their gold, their silver, the wealth of their nation under a temple to the sun god, right? Do you know what America actually did, where the U.S. Treasury is? It is a replica of that very temple. Think about that for a second. We do a lot of what they do. If this book were to be written today by Paul, I have no doubt he would title it The Americans. The Americans. Read it as such today as we're going through it. So we've inherited from them much of our system of government, much of our legal structures, even our architecture, as I described. Sadly, many of our sins also seem inspired by them as well. Sexual sin was rampant in their culture. Human life had little value. How does one deteriorate to such a place sinfully where you're willing to do what has been the most cruel thing that any human has ever invented as a torture device, which is to hang a man from a tree? And to do so publicly, to put up a cross and hang it out there on the streets where people would go by. We often think of that story where Jesus is hanging on the cross as if he's up there on this big hill. No, they would crucify people and put them right by Blanding Boulevard, so to speak, so that you would drive by them at eye level. Thus, if you ever came against Rome, you know what your penalty would be. These were some sick people, right? And we mirror them in so many ways at times that it is absolutely scary. In their prosperous times, they sought to entertain themselves to death. Why y'all getting so quiet? Do we not do the same thing, right? We seek to do the same thing. They attempted to extend their empire militarily throughout the entire globe, which ultimately began to result in their downfall as each military exploration would cost them more and more. Thus, they began to debase their money, which we do the same thing. You ever heard of this word called inflation, right? Y'all have experienced that from time to time, right? So what they would do is they would clip the corners of their gold and their silver. They would have these little clippings so that they could try to buy more with less. So mysteriously in our generation, you know what they do? Because you can't go clipping your dollars. You know what they do? Have you ever noticed those package sizes keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller? Like you used to go buy a pound of coffee. Now it's like 12 ounces. Come on, Jesus, right? You used to go buy that half gallon of ice cream. Somehow that still stays the same, but the half gallon of ice cream is now less, right? So they're doing the same thing. They're clipping it. You're, we're experiencing the same thing they did. This could have been entitled to us. They spent too much. They sinned too much. They debased their currency. Their empire then began to crumble. Now there's some elections coming up on Tuesday, are there not? I'm not here to get political because, frankly, I think half the time they're both sides of the same coin, right? 
I do not put my trust in the ballot box. I put my trust in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, right? But Washington would do well to heed what happened to the Roman Empire because it is but a repeat performance. The city of Rome remains one of the greatest cities in the world, and her influence is still felt all throughout the world. Mary Jo and I were able to go there a few years ago. I think they're going to display a couple of the pictures up there from when we were there. We got to see wonderful places like the Trevi Fountain. I mean, you want to talk crazy, like you're walking around in this big metropolitan city, and you turn the corner, and you see that? I mean, wow, how amazing was that? You could just flow through some of the other ones. Um, we got to take a picture in front of there. That's one of their big government buildings that they have. Do you see how even Washington has inspired many of our buildings by those same kinds of things? Keep flowing through. You don't have to wait for me. Um, just beautiful, beautiful architecture, beautiful paintings that they have. We got to go visit the Vatican and see all of those sites. It was such a mind-blowing experience. Yet in all of her splendor, Somehow, a ragtag group of 12 men end up being the beginning of the end of her empire. I really like to bring these similarities home because I truly believe with all my heart that if it were written today, it would be titled, as I said earlier, The Americans. See, God planted something on Paul's heart that he could get there, that he could get to that city that was the most influential city of his day because he knew that if he could save people there through their influence, it would spread all throughout the world. I pray that God would give us that same kind of a heart, that same kind of a spirit for our city that we would want to see the people here in Jacksonville come to know Jesus, that it would spread from Jacksonville to St. John's County and to Putnam County and to Clay County and to Baker County and the surrounding areas. And it starts with people like you and me who are willing to serve the Lord with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind and go after it with everything that is within us. Let us pray and begin to read God's word. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory. As we dive into these words, let us first remember the sweet time of worship that we had, how wonderful it was to sing praises of this king who came to set us free, and to realize even through Roman culture and society that we'll be studying today that there's so many similarities to what we're experiencing today. And Father, we pray that you would use people like us, as you did Paul and others in his day, to spread the word of Jesus throughout our city to invite people to encounter you as their Lord and Savior, to not put their trust in Rome, to not put their trust in money, to not put their trust in politics, to not put their trust in the systems of this world or the sin of this world, but to put their hope and their trust in you and you alone. So as I preach today, may I not do so with eloquent words, but Lord, may I do it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Would you use these words to touch each of our hearts, mine included, to change us, to transform us, to cause terror where terror is due, cause hope where hope is due, because you are the hope of the world. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So we're going to start right in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to jump in at verse 8. It says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed to all the world. So Paul gets there and he first encounters some believers. There's people who have gone before him who were actually in Rome. There's people who have gone before us who made it possible for Journey Church to actually be here, right? So he shows up and there's a group of people that their faith is actually being proclaimed. The things they're doing, the people they're touching, the difference they're making. It's known all the way where Paul was previously at. He hears these stories. May the same be told of you of how this very week you packed out over 200 Thanksgiving food baskets. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Hey, you're being generous. You're going out there and touching families that are in need. You're making a difference outside of yourselves. You're serving. You're going into the jails. You're going into the homeless places. You're going out into the streets and telling people about Jesus. And Paul commends them on that, as you're going to see. And he is there, and he tells us what his purpose is in these next set of verses. Romans 1.9, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his son, 
that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you in Romans 1.11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So he longs to be there. God withheld that from him for a season, but now he's there amongst them and he's going to get to minister alongside of them. And guess what? They're about to change the world together. God starts this movement to the Gentiles, the people who are non-Jewish in Rome. We're benefiting from it today. We're sitting here today because of this very story that we're reading. So he goes there, he commends them, and he says, I'm here to encourage you, but at the same time, Paul also admits that he's being encouraged. How amazing is that? Every time you share the gospel with somebody, we think we're doing it for their benefit. But guess what? Actually, we're mutually encouraged and we receive encouragement at the same time. So if you're down, if you're feeling outside, go outside of yourself and go start ministering to other people and see if God doesn't change your heart in so doing. Watch and see what he would do. Our God is an amazing God, and I pray right now that, Lord, you would give us the same kind of heart as Paul and those early Christians there in Rome, that we would love our city, that we would love its people, that we would go beyond ourselves to see them come to know you, that, Lord, you would give us a heart that is after your heart, that we would long to see our city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Why is he there? Acts 1, 13, or Romans 1, 13. It might say Acts. It's actually Romans. My apologies. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but this far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to both Greeks and barbarians, both the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Timing is everything, right? I think of the story of um, the Old Testament where they're praying and interceding and the prayer's not answered for 21 days, right? In fact, we're going to be entering into, in January, a 21-day season of prayer and fasting to kick off the new year. Begin to prepare yourself spiritually because I have no doubt that God is going to be doing some breakthroughs In and through Journey Church, some amazing things are around the corner. We need to start praying now. We need to start believing now. We need to start fasting now to be ready. Come on, right? We need to be interceding and asking God to move in our city. So the timing opens up. There's a battle in heavenly places. It was over the city of Rome, and it's over the city of Jacksonville today. There's a battle going on in heavenly places. Adam talked about it when he shared from Tozer a little bit earlier. We're not here to entertain you. We're here to equip you to go out there and go to war for Jesus, to tell the world about who he is. That's why you're here. I've said this many times. He's called you for such a time as this. You're not here on accident. You didn't walk through these doors on accident today. God brought you here under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because he wants to use you to make a difference in your generation. There's people that you know that I will never be able to reach. God wants to use you. That's your purpose. That's your calling. That's why you breathe. That's why you exist. He's placed you here at this point on the timeline of eternity to share the good news of Christ with our generation. Would you please let that sink in? We read these great stories of people like Paul and we think that they're necessarily unique when they're not. There's a little bit of Paul inside of each one of us because you know what empowered Paul? The Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was available to Paul, the person of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the one we make fun of when people start speaking in tongues. Come on, Jesus, right? That same Holy Spirit is inside of you that caused the earth to be formed and created, that empowered Jesus while he was here, that empowered Paul. The Holy Spirit rests on you as a believer in Jesus Christ. You are powerful. You are mighty. You are. Don't look like it right now, but you are called. The spirit of the living God is inside of you. Let that sink in. 
You were not defeated. You're not a woe is me Christian. You are an overcomer in Christ Jesus because the power of the living God rests inside of you and wants to come out of you to make a difference in the lives of others. But what holds us back? Romans 1, starting in verse 18 through 32 You're welcome to go read it as homework. I've shared it many times. It's absolutely depressing. I'm not going to go there today. But he talks over and over again about the sins that were present in that generation. I dare you to read it and tell me if it's not the same kind of things that we're dealing with today. Absolutely, utterly the exact same kind of sins repeated over and over again. Why do we not see the power of the Holy Spirit lived out among us at times? Because there's still in sin inside of us that needs to get out through repentance, that needs to get out by the love of God coming into our life, changing and transforming our hearts and our minds, and then us beginning to live it out. It doesn't all happen in an instant. For some, it does. Praise God. For some of us, some of the deepest sins in our life, the second we made that first time confession to Jesus, immediately they were gone, right? For other types of things, they're strongholds in our life. Sometimes they take time. They take dedication. They take moments on our knees. They take crying out to God to begin to change those. But there's a beautiful thing that if you are crying out to God because of some sin in your life, that means the Holy Spirit is present in your life. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, you would feel no condemnation for your sin. You would go out there and keep doing what you're doing. So if you have even a tinge of guilt over things that you might be doing, rejoice, 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 because that means the Holy Spirit is at work inside of you. In fact, the opening six or seven chapters of the book of Romans are absolutely terrifying. Go read them. He condemns absolutely everybody, oftentimes starting with the preachers and the teachers, and he goes on to touch each one of us, if you'll dare read it, with different areas of our life where we might be dabbling in various sins, and he gives us cautions against those, but then he begins to give us hope for the remainder of the book of Romans. Romans 2.24 says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Who do you think he was speaking to? The average everyday sinner out there? Or do you think he was speaking to that local church even though he praised them on one hand? On the other hand, he's actually giving them a little bit of a no holds barred moment, right? I do not want to be the one that people look at me and God's name is blasphemed because of the way that I'm acting or behaving that doesn't line up with God's word. That's where I say these verses sometimes terrify me. When I look at my own life, And I look at my own actions. I certainly don't believe there are any that are disqualifying at the moment. But when I look at the church in general sometimes, not just Journey Church, the church in America and the ways in which we behave and how we're no different than the world, why would anybody want to become a part of the church when they can already get all that we have from the world? Some of you are excited. (laughs) There's truth in that though, right? If we don't look any different than the world, why would the world be attracted to what we have? Yet if they want what we have, they will go to any length to get it. If they see the Holy Spirit at work in us, if they see us loving others, if they see us grace-filled, if they see us fighting against the sin that wars within us, because guess what? It doesn't all go away in an instant, right? Have you noticed that? Think of even Paul, right? He goes, the sin that lives within me. Oh, what a sinful man I am. He calls himself the chief among sinners, and we look at him as like the holy saint. Come on, right? We look at him as if he's this guy that's bigger than life itself. But man, he says, I am chief among sinners. He sees the sin in his life, and it convicts him. And he says, I want to change, but I can't do it in and of myself. This sin that I want to change, I can't seem to overcome it on my own. But... For the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, beginning to work inside of him to transform his heart, transform his mind, transform his desires. So if you're stuck in that place today, cry out to the Holy Spirit. Change me, Holy Spirit of God. Would you transform me? I want to be more like you. Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Amen? May we never blaspheme the Holy Spirit amongst the Gentiles. May nobody ever look at us and say, I don't want to be a Christian because I see the way and that they're acting. And I said, in Romans 2.21, he says, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? 
So I think he judges us as leaders also first and foremost. And I think all of us are leaders to a degree. If you're a Christian, you're a leader. People are looking at you. They want to see us making a difference. They want to see that our words and our actions line up. So there was a problem in that early church as well where pastors would get up and they would preach the word and tell everybody else what to do. And then they would go on doing what they wanted to do. And he's saying, that's not okay. So I assure you that I felt great conviction as I was reading these words and preparing this message today that, man, I never want to do anything that would cause another to stumble. One of the final slaps in the face, there's a few more during the course of these messages, but Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. Are y'all feeling pretty low about right now? You ready for the hope? I promise I'll get there in just a second. But he wants us to feel the sting of our own sin first, right? He wants us to examine our own hearts first. And that's how he set up Romans. He challenges us in these things that we accept as a culture and both as individuals, right? As we look out there and we accept these things that we know are sin, oh, it's okay because the government sanctions it. No, it's not. And let me tell you, they will all ultimately fall one day. Anything that doesn't line up with God's word will one day fall, be it an institution or an individual, right? God will call everything to account one day. And that's what he's saying. There's none that seek God. But thanks be to God, Jesus died and the Holy Spirit has been released onto the earth to touch hearts and begin to change lives. And that's why you're here today, because God's drawing you to be able to hear a message this morning. There's areas of your life that he wants to see transformed, some for the first time, others for the first time in a long time, others to elevate to the next level of your faith because you're already supercharged as is, right? But that's why he has you here, to continue to change us and transform us that we might look more like his son you jump all the way to Romans 6, 7, it says, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So what he's saying is none of us seek God. And guess what? In order to get freed, you have to die. How do you like that one? (laughs) But thanks thanks be to God, we're three beings in one, right? We're spirit, soul, and body. That old nature, that old man needs to die and then spirit. Spirit of God needs to come alive in our spirit, igniting our spirit to be in alignment with his spirit where we can have life, where we can have freedom. That old man under the waters of baptism goes into death. You come out in newness of life. Your very desires begin to change, and many of you have already experienced that. You no longer desire those things of Romans chapter 1, those sins that you used to get all excited about because you were going out on Friday night to partay, right? You no longer desire to do that anymore. God's changed your heart. He's ignited your spirit. That's the living God at work within you. How awesome is that? (laughs) Romans 7, 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to one another to him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit. Put another way, we are dead to sin. We are alive to Christ. Romans seven seventeen. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want, I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be the law that when I want to do right, evil is often close as hand. Can anybody relate to this? For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see its members, another law waging war against my mind and taking me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Oh, what a wretched man I am who will deliver me from this body of death? Question mark. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So if you're struggling, God wants to kill off that struggle area in your life and replace it with great joy. How does it happen if you're a believer and you're struggling in these areas? You got to get with Jesus you got to spend time with them. And I'm going to do a whole message on um, 
the, the Super Bowl Sunday that I, I, I have about how the symptoms that we have as human beings and our gluttony and our eating are all but a symptom of the spiritual condition that we're actually all going through. Guess what? If you eat junk food all the time, you're not very healthy and you get nothing but fat, right? But if we're out there feasting on Facebook and we're out there feasting on the news media and we're out there feasting on Hollywood's television and Hollywood's movies and we're not reading the word and we're not getting energized by the word and we're not worshiping with other believers and we're not in a small group, how do we ever expect to get healthy as a group of people, right? But think about it even one more, like if you only ate one good meal a week, you'd be running on empty all the time, right? Think about it. Yet we know all these things in the natural and we still do what's wrong half the time, do we not? So why is it any different in the spirit? The difference is that if you, the Bible says that he will reward those who seek him. He will not leave you wanting. If you will take the time to go seek him, you will find him. I thank you for being here seeking him this morning. I thank you for coming out and saying, Jesus, you're my priority. You're the beginning of my week. You're the reason I'm here. Scripture puts it this way, Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. If you're on Facebook a whole lot more than you're in the Word, guess what? You're probably going to be struggling because everybody puts their best life now out there and their lives really are all jacked up and they're only putting the good parts of it on there. So you think that they're so wonderful and you're feeling so crummy then you lie and put how good you're doing out there at the same time. If you set your mind on the things of the flesh and the things of the mind, that's what you're going to reap. If you want your life to change and you want to experience the power of God in your life once again, if you want to experience joy and you want to experience true freedom, you need to draw close to him. Furthermore, listen to this one last gangster set of verses. Romans 8, 9. You who have, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. He's speaking to you believers. Why? Because in fact, the spirit of God dwells within you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. You know what that means? You can have victory over sin. You can have victory in this life. You don't have to be the underdog. You can be victorious because the spirit of the living God is alive in you. So you have a choice to make. See, in Romans chapter 9 and 10, he begins to call people to a decision. He says, you could either continue living for the flesh and reap the things of the flesh, or you could live for God and see everything changed and become a part of this world-changing movement of drawing people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's hope for us all. God has a way of changing our hearts, even the hearts of those who seem hardest. It always seems a miracle when they come to know Jesus. But Romans 9.15 says, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. Our God is still sovereign. Aren't you glad he's had mercy on you? Aren't you glad? Never forget it. Aren't you glad he came to save you in spite of our sins? Aren't you glad? Would you love to experience that joy, grace, freedom, and mercy today? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? How does one receive it? After sharing all those difficult things, he shares with them how they could receive hope. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 9, says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. Would you do that right now? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes if you haven't already done so? I thank you for being here. I thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. Man, your presence really does matter. When we're gathered here, I know you experience the joy of hanging out with other believers. I pray you continue to prioritize that in your week. It shows that you're putting his word into practice. You're seeking him first. I encourage you to continue on from here and do that in your daily life. Start to pray tomorrow. Wake up and don't immediately turn on the news. Don't immediately pick up your phone. But get up out of your bed and get on your knees and say, God, I'm putting you first in my day. I think all of us understand this thing of sin. For those of us who are not believers, there seems little hope as described in the Bible. But the hope that comes in is that God came to die in our place for our sins that we might have life. And many of you in this very room have received that already. Some of you have received that and you know you're still struggling but you wanna be free from that. I wanna pray for you today. So here's the groups of people I'd like to pray for today. Is today a day where you just sense after hearing the word and all that you've experienced that you need to surrender your life to God? If that's you, man, I want to pray for you. I promise I will do absolutely nothing to embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you this morning. Or maybe you are already a believer. Your salvation is secured, but you know that the struggle is real and you want to be set free from it. And man, you're seeking the Spirit of God. I'm going to pray that he will meet you here today. So if you're of either of those two groups and really want to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ today, I want you to do this. Just raise your hand up real high so I can see it right where you're at and I'll pray with you. Is that you today? I see your hand, sir, and your hand, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else here today? see your hand right there in the center. Thank you, Lord. And yours and yours. Thank you, Lord. And yours right there in the front. Thank you, Lord. If you raised your hand, I want you to do something. Remember when I talked about how they put the cross up there so that everybody would see? And um, they did it in a very bad way. But Christ says that if you will acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven that we want to celebrate with you. And again, I promise to do nothing to embarrass you. I just want to join hands with you and pray for you. Everybody around you will cheer. But if you raised your hand, would you do me a favor and just come right here to the front? I'd love to pray with you right now. If that's you, come on up. I'd love to pray for you and with you. Thank you. So excited for you. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I and thank you. Come on, Journey. Keep clapping. God bless you. Just stay right here. We'll all pray. God bless you. Journey, keep inviting. God is moving. He's changing lives. You don't have to stay over there. We're glad you're here. Come here. Come on over with them. We got some friends here with you. Come on. Give her a big round of applause, too. Journey, this is what it's all about. Father, we all bow our heads, we close our eyes this very morning, and we thank you for your word to the Romans, I mean the Americans. Lord, we thank you that you still want to change lives today, even as you did back then. And Father, there are those who are in this room today who have been touched by your spirit this morning, and we acknowledge that today. Father, we thank you for your presence We ask you to just begin to move in their lives and stir something powerful that would last from this life and into eternity. That, Lord, we all publicly declare along with them that Jesus Christ, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. We put our full hope and our trust in you by your blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. We are forgiven of all our sins and made white as snow. And from this moment forward, we make a public declaration, not just those who are here at the front, but all of us who are in this room, that we will serve you forevermore. Your name will never be blasphemed for our sake. We're going to lift you up. We're going to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I ask you to pour out your spirit into those who are up here today. Right now, just pour out your spirit into them in a new and special way. Let them sense their forgiveness. Let them sense your love. Let them sense your grace. Let them sense your mercy. Let them sense your joy. Father, you are the king of the universe, and we are glad that we could worship you this morning. 
For those who did come to the front, I want to encourage you to not immediately go back to your seats. You're going to notice there's some people standing next to you with a Bible. They would love to give you just a little bit more information about how to take some next steps in Christ. Make sure you understand why you came up here. If you're a family member of theirs, they're, they're going to be in good hands for just a moment. Guys, if you want to take them off to the side, give them one more huge round of applause. Man, thank you so much for being here. Live for Christ throughout the course of this week. Go make a difference with your lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come back next week and bring me some chili to eat. And let's have an absolutely great time. God bless you guys until we see you again.